When the tea came, he watched in silent fascination while her hands flitted above the tray, looking miraculously fine and slender in contrast to the coarse china. It seemed wonderful to him that anyone should perform with such careless ease the difficult task of making tea in public on a lurching train. He would never have dared to order it for himself, lest he should attract notice. But secure in the shelter of her conspicuousness, he, zip, he zipped the inky draught with a delicious sense of exhilaration. Lily, with the flavor of Selden's caravan tea on her lips, had no great fancy to drown it in the railway brew, which seemed such a nectar to her companion. But one of the charms of tea is the fact of drinking it together, and she proceeded to give the last touch to Mr. Bryce's enjoyment by smiling at him across her lifted cup. Is it quite right? I haven't made it too strong, she asked solicitously. And he replied with conviction that he had never tasted better tea. <laughs> I dare say it's true. Her imagination was fired by the thought that Mr. Grice was perhaps actually taking his first journey alone with a pretty woman. It struck her as providential that she should be the instrument of his initiation. Some girls would not have known how to manage him. They would have overemphasized the novelty, trying to make him feel in it the zest of an escapade. But Lily's methods were more delicate. Her cousin Jack Stempney had once defined Mr. Grice as the young man who had promised his mother never to go out in the rain without his overshoes. <laughs> she resolved to impart a gently domestic air to the scene in the hope that her companion, instead of feeling that he was doing something reckless, would merely dwell on the advantage of always having a companion to make one's tea in the train. <laughs> but in spite of her efforts, conversation flagged. There was, however, one topic she could rely on, one spring that she had only to touch to set his simple machinery in motion. She had refrained from touching it because it was a last resource. But as a subtle look of dullness began to creep over his features, she saw that extreme measures were necessary. <laughs> and how, she said, leaning forward, are you getting on with your Americana? His eye became a degree less opaque, as though an incipient film had been removed, and she felt the pride of the skillful operator. I've got a few new things, he said, suffused with pleasure. She returned a sympathetic inquiry, and he was drawn on to talk of his latest purchases. It was the one subject which enabled him to forget himself. Hardly any of his acquaintances cared for Americana, and this ignorance threw Mr. Bryce's knowledge into an agree agreeable relief. The only difficulty was to introduce the topic and to keep it to the front. But Miss Bart, it appeared, really did want to know about Americana. She questioned him intelligently, heard him submissively, <coughs> and he grew eloquent under her receptive gaze. Bryce talks and Lily appears to listen until the train stops at Garrison. A boarding passenger creates a commotion. It is a pretty woman accompanied by a maid, a bull terrier, and a footman staggering under a load of bags and dressing cases. Oh, Lily, are you going to Belmont? Then you can let me have your seat, I suppose. But I must have a seat in this carriage. Porter, you must find me a place. Can't someone be put somewhere else? <laughs> oh, how do you do, Mr. Bryce? Do please make him understand that I must have the seat next to you and Lily. <clears throat> Mrs. George Dorset stood in the middle of the aisle. She was smaller and thinner than Lily Bart. The small, pale face seemed the mere setting of dark, exaggerated eyes. She takes the seat of a departing passenger, explaining, meanwhile, that he had come across from Mount Ki she had come across from Mount Kisco and had been kicking her heels at garrisons without even a cigarette. Her brood of a husband having neglected to replenish her case. And at this hour of the day, I don't suppose you've got a single one left, have you, Lily? She plaintively concluded. Miss Bart caught the startled glance of Mr. Percy Grice, whose own lips were never defiled by tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> what an absurd question, Bertha, she exclaimed, blushing at the thought of the store she had laid in at Lawrence Selden's. <laughs> Why? Don't you smoke? 
Since when have you given it up? <laughs> what? You never? And you don't either, Mr. Bryce? Ah, of course, how stupid of me, I understand. <laughs> and Mrs. Dorset leaned back against her cushions with a smile, which made Lily wish there had been no vacant seat beside her. 